You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Check and Finding Genius podcast. I have uh, Dr. Robin Smith. He obtained his PhD in nuclear physics in December 2017 at University of Birmingham. Um, since approximately August 2017, he's been a lecturer in physics at Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. He specializes in the fields of radiation detection, nuclear data, nuclear structure, and nuclear astrophysics, examining uh, atomic nuclei and uh, things like that. So I'm glad to have him. Robin, thank, thank you for coming. How are you doing? Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm I'm very well, thank you. Just just about recovered from from the new year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, what? Um, well, maybe it's a strange question. What what interests you in um, in nuclear physics as opposed to uh, other areas of physics? Why that area? Um, I'll I'll be honest. So so my my, my day job here teaching at, at Sheffield Hallam involves a lot of teaching. So I, t- I teach all areas of physics um, a- a- as a uni professor. And I'd say that most researchers in physics, they, they kind of fall into their field through just kind of blind luck. You know, you, you work your way through a degree program, you, you get acquainted with certain professors, um, and then you kind of fall into a particular discipline. Um, obviously, if you're in that discipline and you didn't like it, then you would you'd kind of fall out of love with it and move on to something else. Um, but in, t- in terms of nuclear physics, I was, I was look- lucky enough as a uh, final year undergraduate student to undertake a project uh, with Professor Martin Freer at the University of Birmingham, where we actually did some experiments colliding nuclei together using a particle accelerator at the university, which when I saw the list of projects that were kind of on, on offer... To, as, as an undergraduate, the ability to smash nuclei together and see what happens um, seemed quite appealing. And, and now I, w- I was right, and I've kind of stuck with it for the sort of six, seven years ever since then, really. So what are you trying to figure out about uh, atomic nuclei? The, you know, well, I guess from what I've learned, being a lay person, but also having a, you know, a degree in engineering, at least, is that uh, it's a ball you know, or a, a cluster of uh, you know, protons and neutrons and things like that. Um, you know, beyond yeah. that, what, uh, what what's to learn about the structure of it? I'm sure there's a ton, but I don't even know where yeah. to begin asking. I mean, so, so yeah, n- n- nuclear physics is an incredibly broad field. And I think that when you speak to a member of the public about nuclear physics, the thing that springs into their mind is kind of nuclear bombs, nuclear power, and that's about it. But But you're right. So, what I try and do is study the atomic nucleus itself, um, and you know, for, for the for the benefit of the people listening who don't have degrees in engineering, I'll, I'll kind of talk to you a little bit about the structure of the atom and and why the nucleus is such an exciting object to study. Um, so you know, ev- everything in the world around us is is made from from atoms. You know, the the table, the laptop computer that I'm talking to you through you know so it's all made from from atoms these kind of these individual building blocks that make of everything in the world around us um not a new idea okay it's been floating around since the ancient Greeks um but those atoms themselves you know unlike what the Greeks thought and unlike what they thought you know maybe 150 odd years ago the the atom itself is a divisible object. It's made of composite parts. It's made from these light particles called electrons that whiz around the outside. They're incredibly light. And then at the very center of the atom, 
there's an object called the atomic nucleus. Now, it's around a million times smaller than the atom itself, but alongside that, it contains over 99.9% of the mass of the atom. Okay, so you can imagine that that object is incredibly dense, you know, far denser than any, any material that we're likely to kind of pick up and examine in our hands. You know, just to put it in context, if I got a, a lump of rock that's around, you know, a thousand kilograms per meter cubed, if I were to grab one of the densest materials on Earth, let's say tungsten, you're looking around 10,000 kilograms per meter cubed. But an atomic nucleus is around 10 to the 17 kilograms per meter cubed. Right? So it's an incredibly dense object, unimaginably dense. Okay? The, the equivalent would be, you know, if, I, if I want to bring this into the real world, if I were to, was to get every single human being on Earth and squeeze them into a playing die, that's how dense the nucleus is. Okay, so it's an incredibly right. dense object that you know, su- surpasses anything that we could possibly imagine I- in the world around us. Um, I have a, a weird question. Um, yeah. Since it's so dense, I, well, I know, all right, well, that may be totally wrong. I know gravity is also a function of the masses involved, but yeah. on a tiny, tiny, tiny scale, on the scale of, you know, I don't know, on the nano scale, or well, I guess way smaller than that, is there a gravitational force exerted by the nucleus on the electron or electrons that are surrounding it? So, so th- this is the this is the weird thing ab- about nuclear physics, right? So, I'm I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, in in nature, we've got four fundamental forces. Um, the ones that we see generally in the world around us are gravity. That's one of them. We have the electromagnetic force which you you can experience day to day. But there are these two other forces. One's called the weak force. um, And the other one, which is the one that binds the atomic nucleus together, is called the strong force. Um, Now, the electrons are bound to the nucleus by the electromagnetic force. So the nucleus itself is positively charged. It contains particles called protons and neutrons. Okay, So these are the subatomic particles, protons and neutrons, the nucleus itself has a net positive charge and the electrons are drawn towards it through the electromagnetic force. And that's, you know, tens of orders of magnitude higher than the gravitational force. So for all intents and purposes, we, you know, in, in atomic physics, we ignore the effects of gravity. Okay. The, the, the force that binds the atom together is the electromagnetic force that we know a lot about. The force that binds the nucleus itself together is called the strong interaction. And it's, as the name suggests, um, it's the strongest force in nature. Um, I think it's around 40 orders of magnitude stronger than gravity. Um, But although it's the strongest force, it's the one that we know the least about. And actually studying nuclear physics, studying the shapes of atomic nuclei, measuring nuclear reactions, the... Nuclear physics at its core is kind of trying to understand not only the nucleus, but the force that binds it together, this, this so-called strong interaction. Mm. And well, it, it, I, I, I guess I have a lot of weird questions here. So, okay, if it's, <laughs> if it's the electrostatic force or an electric, uh, sorry, I guess the, uh, let's, let's, I guess if we look at a uh, hydrogen atom, you know, very yeah. simple, just a proton in the nucleus and one electron. How yeah. come the uh, proton and the electron aren't just drawn towards each other and then they collide, you know, by the force? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's similar to how the moon orbits around the Earth. If you were to have the moon and the Earth next to each other, there's a gravitational force that extends between the two of those and pulls them together. But the fact that you have some initial motion means that the gravitational force induces an orbit of the, of the moon around the Earth. And in a similar kind of way, the motion of the electron around the atom means that it can sit in this um, complex co- you know, quantum mechanical orbital that's stabilized by the electrostatic force without it being dragged into the very center. Um, now, if you were to try and model the atom like the solar system, for example, if we treated the nucleus like the sun and the electron like a planet, for example, and then you just treat them as these two little objects orbiting around each other, that model breaks down. That's, that's called the Rutherford model of the atom, you know, developed nearly 100 years ago. 
And it turns out that that system can't be stable because as the electron would orbit around in this kind of circular path around the nucleus, it would radiate energy. And in doing so, it would kind of spiral in towards the center of the atom and hit the nucleus. Um, and herein kind of lies the origins of quantum mechanics. Okay? Quantum mechanics was developed in line with the understanding of the atom. And the only way that an, a- an electron can live in an atom in a stable way without this kind of spiraling into the nucleus is if it behaves like a wave. Okay? And th- this is the kind of founding part of quantum mechanics that subatomic particles behave like waves, not like these little billiard or, you know, pool balls orbiting around each other. Um, the electron, in fact, behaves as a wave and exists around the nucleus as this probability wave. Well, when you say a wave, yeah. where, well, I guess a stupid way of putting it, where is it waving? Is it pulsing in and out of existence, like in and out of the vacuum, or is it pulsing and waving uh, you know, in a line with its direction of travel? Is it, you know, where is it? Yeah. Um, where are the crests and troughs of the wave uh, appearing? It, it, it all, so the, the, the crests and the troughs all depend on the, the quantum mechanical state that the electron lives in inside the atom. Now, for, for hydrogen, the example that you gave, the electron lives in an orbital that has zero angular momentum. And that means that the wave exists as kind of a, a spherical blob around the nucleus. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not a wave in the classical sense that you would imagine a wave traveling down a string or on top of, you know, a, a wave traveling along the surface of, of water. It's, it's more like a probability wave. So the electron occupies a probability wave around the nucleus. And if you were to measure that electron, if you were to somehow measure where that electron was, the wave function of the electron, the wave function that describes the motion of the electron would collapse and you would measure the electron at a single point in space. However, this is the strange thing about quantum mechanics. When we're not looking at quantum mechanical particles, they behave like waves. But if we measure them, they collapse and behave like particles. And so the wave of the electron surrounding the nucleus isn't a wave in the typical sense of the word. It's more like a probability wave. And so it defines the probability of finding the electron at any point within the atom. But if it has no angular momentum, is it even moving the electron, or is it just, I don't know, just pulsing somehow? I, it's hard to figure out what it even looks like. Yeah. Um, so I mean, the yeah. Okay. Let let let, let me think about this. So <laughs> I know it's hard to answer. <laughs> no, I mean, if, if if I if I had a whiteboard with me, I I could show you a wave traveling around an object with with no angular momentum. Um, ooh. This well, is- I've seen, yeah. I've seen, for instance, the you know the innermost orbital is is you know I guess they call it the s orbital and it's yeah. it's spherical. The probability cloud of it is spherical, but yeah, you know, I don't know. Does it, does it even make sense to say why is that instead of looking like a, a dumbbell, like a p orbital? Why why is it spherical? Um, and again, so is, I'll, is it moving? I'll, I'll give you a, a classical analogy, and then, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit about the why. Um, so imagine you had a circular dish of water and you just dipped your finger into the middle of this dish of water. You'd have a wave that propagated outwards towards the side of the dish, kind of a circular wave, and it would propagate inwards back towards the center of the dish. Mm. Now, if you dipped your finger in there at just the right frequency, at sort of the resonant frequency of that water, what you would see is a standing wave on the surface of the water that appears to be spherically symmetric. Okay, so you'd be inducing a wave to go out towards the edge, but as it comes back in, it would superimpose back on top of the wave that you were next setting up with your hand. And so what you'd have is this spherically symmetric standing wave. Okay, so it's the wave doesn't appear to be moving. Okay, just just like if you pluck a guitar string, you can kind of see the the nodes and the antinodes on the string, but it doesn't appear to be moving. And that and that's what you'd get if you were dipping your finger in the water in this circular dish. Um, d- does that make sense? Does that explain how you yeah, yeah. Can, like, a, you a circular see, waveform? Right, you may see concentric circles, and you may just see one. But what? Okay, well, then what would be the driver of the amplitude of the wave? You know, even to keep it as a as an apparent standing uh-huh. wave that sits in one place. What's the? Yeah. 
so 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 you're right in 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 classical physics we'd be using our finger to induce that but the only reason that we would need to drive it in this way would be because the system is losing energy to its surroundings because it's it's an imperfect system you have friction on the sides of the containers the the water as it passes through the air will experience air resistance and so you have to keep that wave going but if you think about an electron orbiting a nucleus in an otherwise empty vacuum these losses don't actually take place so if you set up a standing wave of an electron around an atom or around a nucleus within an atom there's there's no need to keep driving it okay well we you know we, we don't know why yet but okay but our best um, representation it i mean so what yeah. what is science's best representation right now of for instance how electrons will will be uh, around the nucleus is it this probability cloud or is there another even better representation nowadays yeah so the 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 best representation that we have is is quantum mechanics and a lot of people aren't happy with quantum mechanics because unlike a lot of things that we can study in physics you you can't derive the equations of quantum mechanics from from basic principles okay quantum mechanics is all derived from something called the schrodinger equation that you may have seen before and basically the schrodinger equation is the equation it's a, it's a second order differential equation that you can solve in order to work out the motion of an electron or any other subatomic particle in whatever environment that you want to put it in okay so in classical physics if i wanted to understand how a ball would fly across the room we have you know newton's laws to tell us how that object is going to move and in quantum mechanics we have the schrodinger equation that we have to solve and it takes the form of a wave equation so in in all areas of physics and engineering you have wave equations and it basically tells you how a wave will propagate within a certain medium and we have something analogous in quantum mechanics called the schrodinger equation and it's troublesome because every other theory in classical mechanics we can kind of derive and think about from first principles and it makes intuitive sense but in quantum mechanics we have to base our belief on the theory or on a theory that has just been dreamt up by somebody called schrodinger um and so schrodinger's equation is more like an axiom we we build quantum theory on top of schrodinger's equation but there's no way to derive it and so all of the electron behavior in an atom all of the nucleon the, the neutron and proton behavior inside the nucleus is all derived from the schrodinger equation so um if you look at for instance a hydrogen atom and you compare it to a gold atom you know with mm -hmm. tons of more protons and neutrons and electrons yeah. in different orbitals does the electron behave more classically and a hydrogen atom behaves more in a quantum sense because it's so uh, much smaller or no so this there's a there's a new sort of area of physics that's developing at the moment that i i don't know a particularly huge amount about but it's it's called quantum biology and it's the idea that quantum mechanical effects can maintain a significance and an importance even in biological systems which are much much larger than kind of atomic or molecular systems um so the the gold atom you say compare with the hydrogen atom it's still fully quantum mechanical you can't approximate the gold atom or the electrons that are traveling within that gold atom in a classical way um but what i would say is that the gold atom is a lot more complicated to analyze the reason being that in in the hydrogen atom you have a proton and an electron and it's a two body system so you only have to consider the interaction between those two particles in the gold atom which has i forget the atomic number of gold maybe 80 something electrons you have the interaction of each electron with the positively charged nucleus but then you have the repulsive force between each of the electrons themselves and so it's a strongly perturbed system that is a nightmare to analyze you you need a supercomputer if you wanted to fully understand the motion of all of the electrons in in the gold atom
Whereas with the app, everything can be done analytically on, on pen and paper. Isn't it amazing? Just trying to analyze one gold atom would take, you know, supercomputing power that, I mean, I don't even know if we have it. Now imagine a system of, you know, 10 to the 80th atoms or, or 10 to the 20th, whatever it is, like a, an organism. It would just be unbelievably complex. I don't know how you'd model it at that level. Yeah. I, I mean, this, so I'm, I'm just trying to think of the, the name of the theory. This, th there's, a, there's a theory in quantum mechanics where you can show that in the limits of large systems, that quantum mechanical rules tend towards the classical counterparts, which is why when I throw a, a baseball across the room, it doesn't behave like a wave and kind of flutter across the other side of the room. It behaves as a solid object, which, right. which is because, you know, somewhere along the line, the, the quantum mechanics kind of gets washed out. Um, but on, on the level of individual atoms, that, that doesn't happen. Um, and, and you're right. It's, it's incredible to think that even a gold atom, we can't fully understand. Um, but atoms much, much smaller than gold are difficult to understand. I mean, if, if you wanted to model an atomic nucleus um, ab initio, so from the beginning, computationally, if you wanted to look at the interaction between every single proton and neutron inside a nucleus, typically you can only really do that for very light nuclei for ones that have up to around 40 protons and neutrons in total. Um, anything more and the system kind of grows out of control and, and not even the most powerful computers can deal with that. Well, is there, um, I, mean, I know these will be impossible questions, but you know, how is it, for instance, in different atoms, supposedly the only thing that differs is number of protons, neutrons and electrons, yet they have all these different properties yeah. You know, where do you think yeah. the emergence comes from? I mean, is, like, if you just have a, a naked nucleus, or let's say you just have a proton that has certain properties, but once an electron is, you know, in partner with it in a hydrogen atom, now it seems to have these emergent properties. And same thing with one atom versus another atom, and same thing with one, you know, molecule versus another molecule. Where do you, where do these emergent properties come from? I mean, so, so they, they emerge purely from, from quantum, quantum theory. Now, it's, it's not just in atoms. It, you, you're right. If, if I were to add an extra electron to a hydrogen atom, say I had, um, you know, a, a negatively charged ion of, of hydrogen, it's, its chemical properties are completely different to that of normal hydrogen. Um, and in the same way, you know, if, if you have a bare neutron, if you just have a neutron sat in space, the neutron is unstable. And after however many minutes it will decay into a proton via beta decay. But if you get that neutron and join it with another proton to make the deuteron, okay, so the, the nucleus of heavy hydrogen, deuterium, then that neutron becomes stable and it can exist, as far as we know, forever. Um, so the, the presence of other subatomic particles does innately change the properties of of particles. Um, now, if we we're talking on, a, on an atomic level, you know, as, as you know, different atoms in the periodic table have vastly different properties. You know, you can go from a noble gas that doesn't interact with anything particularly easily and go to a slightly higher mass element, simply adding one more electron and the chemical properties completely change. And that, that all boils down to the uh, the orbitals that the electrons occupy within those atoms. So if the electron yeah, it's just, orbital it's weird. has a completely different shape, then its chemical properties will be completely different. And this, this all boils down to Schrodinger's equation and solving that equation for different systems. So, um, well, I'll ask you one more thing, and then I'm sorry, I, I, I've been asking my questions. I want to get to what you're specifically working on. but um, <laughs> No, it's, it's good fun to answer these kind of questions, actually. Keeps have, me on um, my toes and reminds me what I <laughs> what I've forgotten over time. Hmm. Has, has anyone taken, let's say, uh, you know, like a, a heavy atom of uranium or gold or yep. one with many many electrons and stripped the, all the electrons away, just leaving a uh, you know a highly ionized nucleus? And if so, uh -huh. yep. is, is there anything interesting that comes from doing that? Um, so if we if we want to study nuclei, um, which which is what 
what what I do for a living, we we have to strip the electrons away from the nucleus in order to accelerate the nucleus and collide it into something else. Um, so actually, stripping electrons away from from the atom is is the way that we sort of begin to study the atomic nucleus. And the properties of the nucleus itself are completely independent of the electrons that surround it. Um, so I mean. You, you can strip the electrons from, from whatever atom you want to, but the interesting things would only happen after you've done something with the nucleus that you're left over with. So as, as an object on its own, if you strip the electrons, it would be a highly charged object. It would move in an electric field. But if you wanted to learn about that object, you have to resort to using particle accelerators, which, which is what my research kind of encapsulates, really. Okay, so what kind of nuclei do you accelerate and how much do you ionize them in order to accelerate them? Do you need, need to make them like, is plus one enough? Or do you, do, you know, and, and then you can accelerate them or do they need to be like plus 20? Has any atom been ionized to like plus 50 or plus 90, for instance? Um, so the, 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 the star that we, we live around, the sun, is, is mainly made of hydrogen and helium. But there, there are other stars in, in our galaxy that are at more advanced stages of their life cycle that contain heavier elements. And because the environment that they live in is so hot, all of the atoms are moving around so quickly, what you get there is something called a plasma, where the electrons and the nuclei are completely separated out from each other. Um, now, for, for my own research, you, you asked what nuclei that I study in particular. Um, just a couple of case studies. So the, the one nucleus that I've spent a lot of time studying is called carbon-12. Um, six protons and six, six neutrons make up carbon-12. Um, but there's a theory in nuclear physics called clustering, which is the idea that s smaller nuclei may exist within bigger nuclei. Um, now, the example for carbon-12 would be that the carbon-12 nucleus or an excited state within the carbon-12 nucleus would consist of three helium nuclei all moving around each other. Okay, so the nucleus kind of Ooh, becomes really? clustered into these three helium. Um, Weird. And we, we think that these structures appear in all kinds of different nuclei. So, for example, beryllium-9, which is another nucleus that I've studied quite a lot, um, is an example of a nuclear molecule where you have two helium nuclei that are bound together by the exchange of a neutron. So we're, we're getting structures that we know exist in sort of molecular physics, and you get similar structures appearing even on the nuclear level, which is a million times smaller. And this, and this is something that not a lot of people have thought about. You know, when, when, you're, when you're studying um, nuclear physics, say, in your freshman year of uh, of college or at high school, you, you're always taught that the nucleus is this blob of protons and neutrons, a bit like a liquid liquid droplet. But actually what's going on there is incredibly complex and you can get these interesting shapes and you can get clustering going on. And, and, and that's the kind of structure side of things that I, um, that, that I look into. Maybe this <laughs> is the source of, uh, of some radioactive decay. I guess if you think of a, a large nucleus... Mm -hmm. before you just said this is just a ball of you know protons and neutrons i wondered if they moved around each other if they rearranged but now you're saying the structure is far more complicated than that yeah i, I mean we, we know that smaller nuclei must must appear in some capacity in larger nuclei because the heaviest nuclei such as plutonium and um, curium americium they all decay through the emission of an alpha particle, which is just the nucleus of helium-4. And so at, at some point within these large nuclei, the helium-4 nucleus must have been produced in order to be ejected in the form of alpha radiation. Um, and what I'm trying to do is kind of extend this cluster model that we know exists in these heavier nuclei that we see from alpha decay, and we're, we're trying to extend this to the, the, lower, the lower mass nuclei. And it, and it works out really, really well. Now, if we if we want to study these these structures, um, it's it's quite difficult. All right. So if if I 
Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to get a little bit um, whimsical here <laughs> with, with what I say, but imagine if you've got something incredibly complicated, such as like a watch or a pocket watch, and you wanted to work out how this thing works. If you were, were smart, what you'd do is you'd sit down with a magnifying glass and a screwdriver and you'd gently take the thing apart. And in doing so, you'd learn exactly how that watch works. Um, but as we've already said, the, the force that binds the atomic nucleus together is incredibly strong. Um, we can't simply unpeel a nucleus and look at what's going on there. Um, so imagine you're trying to unscrew the back of the watch and it's all glued together and you can't, you can't look inside. Well, the one thing that you could do, I'm not saying it's the best thing to do for a watch. If you wanted to understand how the watch works, you could throw the watch at the wall and it would explode. There'd be springs and cogs and bits of metal flying everywhere. But as long as you took a video recording of that explosion incredibly accurately, you could piece back together what was happening in the watch before the explosion. Um, and that's kind of what we do in nuclear physics. If, if I want to know what's happening or what the structure of the carbon-12 nucleus is, I would create a target of carbon-12, and then I would fire a beam of other particles onto it, let's say helium nuclei. That would excite the carbon into some higher energy state, perhaps a state that involves this clustering into helium nuclei, and then that state would explode or decay, and it would break apart, and we want to record that as accurately as we can um, in order to piece together what was happening during the nuclear reaction. Um, when, when you, um, you use yeah. uh, as your accelerated um, objects are helium nuclei, or are they just protons? Like what is your uh, preferred accelerated object? And if you smash a proton versus a helium nuclei, yeah. you know, what's the difference? Um, so the, the, an the answer to that's quite, quite subtle. We, we drew on, on the idea of angular momentum earlier. Um, now, the, the helium nucleus has no angular momentum. It's, it's, the, the system is quite inert in that sense. There's no angular momentum. And at the same time, the carbon-12 nucleus in its ground state also has no angular momentum. And so if you collide the helium nucleus with the carbon, you have two systems of zero angular momentum interacting. And it turns out that during the analysis, those systems are just a lot easier to, to analyze. The, the proton, on the other hand, okay, you can, you can kind of do the same thing. You can excite a nucleus with a proton, but because it has angular momentum, the analysis is just a little bit more difficult. Okay, working out how these fragments fly apart, the angular distribution that they each have as they're kind of separating out during the decay is just a little bit more complicated to analyze. So, so you, you, you're right. It's, it's a good question. So if you fire a proton directly at yeah. know, carbon-12, yeah. the spray pattern of the, the, you know, the protons and neutrons, et cetera, that come off of it will be at an angle because the proton, even though it, it, it has what, its own internal angular momentum, so then it, it preferentially yeah. sprays particles in a direction. It, exactly. Yeah. So if if you if you collide one particle into another, let, let let's let's talk simply for a second. Let's say I I collide helium with carbon. Um, what happens is I produce an excited state in the carbon, um, and that excited state will have some angular momentum. It might have zero angular momentum, might have one or two units of angular momentum. But the the way that we recognize the angular momentum of the state that's produced is by looking at the relative directions of the particles that are emitted. Um, and that's quite straightforward to do. But if you introduce the added complexity of the fact that a proton, if you fired a proton at the carbon, the fact that that proton itself has some kind of innate angular momentum, then that would kind of disrupt this nice pattern that we would expect and make it a little bit harder to work out the angular momentum of the states that we are producing in carbon-12. How, um, how fast is your, again, I don't have the words for it, but how fast is the time, the step between periods of time in which you can observe the collision? And yep. if it's fast enough, can you observe any pre-collision behavior? Is there any change in something that you can observe 
right before the collision happens, but when the two yeah. you know, nuclei are super close to each other. So t- typically nuclear reactions happen over a time period of around 10 to the minus 18 seconds. So what's that? Um, 10 to the minus 15 is femtoseconds. Um, what, what, whatever 10 to the minus 18 is. Um, uh, attoseconds, whatever it is. At, attosecond, yeah. So it's, it's, it's an attosecond um, process. And so, so what, what that means is it's quite difficult to infer the details of the reaction. We, we ha- what we have to do is resort to kind of indirect methods. So for example, I, I talked about carbon-12, so I'll, I'll stick with that. If, if you have the carbon-12 nucleus, if it behaves like three helium nuclei all moving around each other, um, eventually the final state of that decay will be three helium nuclei. And that, that's what we measure in the laboratory. And the only way that we can infer how it got to that final state is by looking at the energies and the angles of those three alpha particles. Now, carbon-12 could, for instance, decay into three helium nuclei spontaneously. Let's call that a direct decay. So it can decay just instantaneously into three particles. But the other thing that could, that could happen is that it, the carbon could emit one helium nucleus, leaving the nucleus of beryllium-8, which will then decay into another two helium nuclei in, in a more sequential decay process. And the way that we kind of disentangle these two options is to look at the relative energies and directions of the alpha particles. And it turns out that if you can measure those energies and those directions with sufficient accuracy, you can distinguish between the two types of decay. Um, so although we're not taking an exact kind of video recording of the decay process itself, within the data, we see these kind of fingerprints or signatures of the kinds of decay processes. So you can look at the decay in a little bit of detail like that. Do you think that um, colliding uh, helium nuclei influences the, the way the decay happens? Two questions. How do you know that larger nuclei are composed of, you know, bonded or, you know, interacting helium nuclei and Mm -hmm. again if they are does that mean that you know if you collide a helium nuclei that's that's like the 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 best thing that you could use for a collision because it just has some maybe resonance of the underlying structure you know does it um so you that that's that's a a really good point um and and what what we have seen especially in the in the case of carbon 12 is that the the decay behavior does appear to change depending on what projectile you're firing at the at the carbon 12. So so my research has been using um, well up until a couple of years ago it was using uh, helium as a as a projectile. Now at the same kind of time there were there was a group in Italy performing similar measurements but they were colliding carbon on carbon or magnesium on carbon, so much heavier projectiles. And the results that they obtained were quite different to mine. Um, So the environment that the reaction is happening in does appear to affect in some way the the outcome of the reaction. Um, Now, that's because, as we've said before, nuclei interact together using... Uh, this this strong nuclear force it's incredibly powerful and if you suddenly stick your reaction into an environment that has a lot more protons and a lot more neutrons it will perhaps perturb the way that the system behaves a much cleaner way to excite a nucleus would be through an electromagnetic probe and what i mean by that is to give the nucleus energy not by colliding it with a proton or an alpha particle or another nucleus, but colliding it with an electron, which will not interact with the nucleus through the strong force. Okay, so it won't interfere with the system so much. Or alternatively, you could collide into your nucleus um, a high energy photon of light. And this is something that's really taking off at the moment, new facilities being built around the world basically building huge high energy gamma ray lasers that we can collide with our nuclei and study them more cleanly. Well, when you say it more cleanly, what do you mean? The, like 
when you compare the, the results of the Italy group versus yours, what's different about them? And what does that tell you? And so the, if you use a high energy photon, what happens? And what does that tell you? So if, if you if you collide, let, let's say we collide helium with with carbon, if you view it as as kind of a, a game of pool in, in a bar, you're you're hitting helium, this, this small pool ball off carbon, which is this kind of weird shape composite object. But the decay of the carbon, the reaction happens so quickly that that decay happens while the initial helium that you were scattering from it is still in the vicinity. Does that make sense? And so the presence of that helium is going to affect the decay of the carbon as we measure it and sort of perturb the decay and kind of limit how well we can understand what's happening in that nucleus. What the Italian group did was they didn't collide helium, they collided carbon or something heavier, and their results differed slightly. And, and you would expect that, in a sense, because you've excited your carbon to some high-energy state, it's going to break apart. But now, instead of being in the proximity of a helium nucleus, it's in the proximity of a much larger nucleus, which is going to perturb the system and perturb the decay in a slightly different way. And the difference in using an electromagnetic probe, such as an electron or such as a high energy photon of light, is that you can give the nucleus energy and then measure what happens during the decay without the presence of an extra nucleus in your system. Oh, okay. And this is something this is something that um, we've performed at the with the University of Connecticut. Um, with a professor there called called Moshe Guy, um, and we we did these experiments at Duke University at the Higgs facility. Higgs stands for high energy, high intensity gamma ray source, where you fire high energy gamma rays onto a carbon target. You excite that carbon into some high energy state, and then you really precisely measure the decay using um, something called a time projection chamber detector. It's kind of a a gas-filled detector that measures the tracks of particles as the decay proceeds. Um, and and this, this idea of using a time projection chamber to measure the paths of the particles, the idea of using a electromagnetic probe, such as light photons, um, is kind of, it's, it's revolutionizing the way we do nuclear physics. So what are some of the big inclusions that have been coming from this, this work, you know, over the past few years? Yeah. Um, so in, in, terms of, in terms of carbon-12, um, a study that was performed a few years ago that, that I just talked about, use, using the Higgs facility at Duke University, colliding a beam of light onto a carbon target, measuring what happens, um, what they determined was that carbon-12 itself is made of three helium nuclei in kind of an equilateral triangle configuration, and the excited states within carbon correspond to spinning those three helium nuclei like a spinning top, which I think is pretty cool. So it's kind of a rotational excitation of the ground state of the carbon-12 nucleus. Does that make sense? Hmm. Um, the, You're saying a nucleus can, an atom can exist in not only different ionization states, but can it exist in an excited nucleus versus unexcited nucleus state? regardless yeah. of the electrons around it. it, it exactly. So the, the electrons don't really come into play. The, this, this, is, this is all about the, nu- the nucleus as, as a, an object in its own right. Well, um, I know, but in, in nature, you know, out in the universe here, uh, okay. yeah. I'm sure that yeah. high energy rays are interacting with nuclei all over the place. So mm-hmm. do you yeah. think there's any stability to, you know, atoms, wherever they are, in us, around us, you know, et cetera, yeah. that... Yeah. that have excited nuclear states versus, you know, the normal state. Yeah, well, it, th- there's, there's a really famous um, instance of that that I, that I can tell you about. Um, so in, in Sheffield, where, where I currently live, um, which is in the, the, the county of Yorkshire in, in England, and in, in Yorkshire, it, it's, it's home to a really famous physicist called Sir Fred Hoyle. Um, and what he discovered around 50 or 60 years ago now, was an excited state in carbon-12. So, you know, carbon-12 generally in nature exists in its ground state, its lowest energy state. 
Um, but what he found was that in stars, as carbon is being produced during these nuclear fusion processes, the carbon-12 exists in something called the Hoyle state, which is this high energy excited state consisting of three helium nuclei. Um, and what we found is that this excited state, you can rotate, you can vibrate and build excitations even on top of that. And so you're right that these excited states appear in, in nature. And in the case of the Hoyle state, it's really important because it turns out that in red giant stars, which is what happens when a star such as our sun has finished burning its, he its hydrogen, it begins to burn helium. Um, in order to build heavier elements on top of helium, you need the near instantaneous convergence of three helium to form carbon-12. And what Fred Hoyle suggested was the existence of a state or a high excited state in carbon-12 consisting of these three helium nuclei in kind of a triangle um, that exists in nature. And, and that's, what's, that's what's been proven in the laboratory. And, th and this is what we're studying in more detail now. So it sounds like a helium nucleus is a building block of, you know, mm -hmm. of atomic nuclei. Are there any other building blocks that you know of that are out there? Besides, um, you know, the individual proton and neutron itself, maybe. Yeah, so this this idea of the the nuclear molecule can be extended into all kinds of other nuclei. Um, for example, the the magnesium nucleus. Um, some of the excited states of the magnesium nucleus can be thought of as two carbon twelve nuclei in kind of a dumbbell configuration, rotating around one another. Um, the the helium nucleus as a building block is the most suitable because it's the most stable configuration of protons and neutrons that you can have. Um, if you were to look at the binding energies of different nuclei or the binding energies per nucleon, so that tells you how much energy binds the nucleus together divided by the mass of the nucleus. The helium nucleus is way, way higher than every other one. And that all boils down to the quantum mechanical orbitals that the protons and neutrons within helium live in. Um, and yeah, so he helium is the, the strongest building block of the, and it's the most tightly bound cluster that you could get w within an atomic nucleus. So although you can see other structures, let's say a carbon-12 and a helium existing as two clusters in a nucleus for, for oxygen-16 or two carbon nuclei in magnesium, um, those systems would only appear at higher energies. Hmm. Really? That is, uh, <laughs> this makes it more complicated. Oh, no. Huh. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that not a lot of people even think about. You know, as, as I said earlier, you, you're, you're taught in, in high school. And, and to be honest, even at degree level, when you study physics, that the atomic nucleus is this spherically symmetric blob of protons and neutrons. The, the idea that they can exist in these weird and wonderful um, configurations is, is foreign even to most physicists. Well, you know, what's yeah. interesting. If you have a larger atom, mm -hmm. it can have a very complex nuclear structure, but yet the orbitals of, uh, of the electrons around it seem to be unchanged, you know, mm -hmm. as you, go up and down the periodic table, you yeah. have, you know, S's, P's, D's, et cetera. Those don't seem to be affected by, apparently, by the underlying structure of the nucleus. Well, or maybe the, I'm wrong, I don't know. The, well, the, this, this is a really interesting point. So an, another way that you can study the shape of a nucleus um, is to actually measure incredibly accurately the electron orbitals. Now, the, the, the way that you would typically model an atom is a infinitely small nucleus at the very center and the electrons interact with that nucleus via the electrostatic interaction. They occupy these orbitals and those orbitals have particular energies. Now, as we know, the nucleus is very, very small, about a million times smaller than the atom itself, but it's not infinitesimally small. Okay, It's not a point-like object. And so it turns out if the nucleus has a finite size and it has a weird deformed shape, 
the shape of the nucleus will actually affect the electron orbitals within the atom itself. And mm. studying those electron orbitals really accurately um, has been a way in recent years to study the structure of the nucleus itself. Really? Well, very good. Well, Robin, I'm, I'm sorry I questioned you to death here, but uh, it's uh, really fascinating, at least to me, obviously to you. So yeah. <laughs> what, what's, the, what, what's the best way for uh, people to start down this rabbit hole and learn more about uh, nuclear physics and about what you're doing? Um, right. Well, the... The best thing I'd say that you can probably do is to um, visit my website. I'll, I'll give you the link to it that you can upload um, upload with the podcast. Um, either my website at Sheffield Hallam or the, my one at University of Connecticut. That's got lots of reading and resources um, where people can, yeah, as you say, go go deep down the rabbit hole, f- further than most physicists will go and learn about all this weird nuclear physics stuff okay excellent well robin thank you so much for coming i know it's uh evening where you are and i appreciate you being here no thanks thanks so much for inviting me on richard it's it's been re- a real pleasure to talk to you and and thanks for your your questions it, it felt like at times that you were second guessing what what i was going to talk about next so <laughs> the, the sign of a good interviewer i think <laughs> thank you You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.